Так, первый слайд нашей презентации. Спасибо. Спасибо. Invite you to start, uh, and uh, in order to start, that oh, Zoom I would like first to explain us uh, the rules of using Zoom platform. Gazette slide, and uh, Eva is asking her colleagues to show the slide with information on how to use Zoom toolbar. And uh, since we are in the Zoom space. Uh, According to the extent that is possible, please use your video and yes. mute yourselves. And also pay your attention to the fact that there is a translation function provided. Yeah, I and for those presentations which uh, need a Russian uh, translation, you can use Russian room by clicking globe sign in the lower part of your screen at the toolbar and also you can be you you can use your chat function in order to ask your questions or to share your comments uh, to be referred to, to the participants and the speakers uh, so according to, to your language of preference please use the appropriate room because uh, during the first part of the uh, uh, of the meeting we will be using presentations and uh, and uh, uh, good day greeting we are greeting tajikistan and there is another important point for us to take into account is that we shall be recording the event uh, today and uh, as it was shown through the notification uh, on the screen, we shall have recording to be supported both in Russian and in English. And I would like to welcome you to our first meeting, Daria, which I would like to greet you at the first meeting of Daria of this uh, thematic module. This is about the data analysis tools and how to develop the skills uh, on this. And, uh, and uh, the goal is uh, to provide the review of the key tools which we can use in order to do the skills forecasting. And these are the tools which are used in EU and also to see what is the uh, progress with the monitoring of the labor market in Central Asian countries. And also we would like, please, to ask you to show the next slide. And uh, that is the agenda for today, and we shall have two presentations today to be delivered by our colleagues uh, who are labor market, labor market experts. And then we will have uh, our colleagues from Central Asian country to share the information about the informational labor market system. And during the presentations, we will also have a few interactive episodes and we will be using soft mentimeter and my colleague Anna who is with me in Turina now she will explain to you how to use it uh, when we will start our interactive session with the mentimeter but before we will move to the main in part of our meeting, I would like to quickly remind to you that what is that is about and what is about the first module, which is about the data and the monitoring. Please, the next slide. 
So you know well that uh, Daria, this is a project of the European Union. This is a regional project which covers five countries of the Central Asian region, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. And the main goal uh, is to get focused on the issues related to the education, training and uh, also labor employment for young people and uh, and that is a project which has a duration of five years and we are at the beginning and, <laughs> and we've started last year and in 2023 we shall start with activities developing different issues related to DARIA project scope. You also know well that the DARIA project has three thematic modules uh, promoting, and these three thematic modules are related to different issues which are extremely important for the educational systems. And the first module, that's the module which is uh, important for us today, that the module which is about uh, the monitoring and analysis of the labor market and the learning and training uh, objectives and results. And uh, the second module, this is related to the qualification aspects. And then the third focus is on the teaching um, issues, teaching agenda. Uh, and a few words about the module one. So as you know, and uh, as we have seen that and witnessed that in the Astana together with the participants who visited us offline, uh, the module one has a main goal, which is to consolidate the informational systems of the labor market and skills, and also to support the exchange of skills in the country, which involves the application of new tools and also then the forecasting of the skills and the transforming them, uh, translating them into practice and also to use international comparative data sets, which are uh, relevant for this transition from training to employment and under each module we have three components and the first one this is uh, uh, training, the second one is uh, piloting and the third one is building the evidences and our today's meeting is about the first component which is the introduction and mutual learning and the, in order uh, to present our first uh, speaker i would like to now switch to english from russian and i hope that uh, you had the chance to activate your translation function. So I would like to give the floor now to my colleague, Francesca Rosso. Please, next slide. Francesca Rosso is the senior labor market expert in ETF, and she will guide us through the key skills anticipation instrument which is the main uh, objective of this uh, introductory session today. And during the presentation, please don't hesitate to share your comments, questions in the chat. We will be able also to open uh, uh, for a few questions at the end of the presentation. And I hope Francesca uh, is with us. And I would like to ask you, Francesca, so why does skills anticipation matter and how can we understand the future skills needs? For you, Francesca. Thank you very much, Eva. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this very important uh, first event of Daria. And let me first of all greet all of our 
uh, friends uh, and colleagues uh, from, from the countries. My name is Francesca Rosso, as Eva has already introduced me. I'm a labor market specialist uh, at the European Training Foundation. Okay. And I coordinate the group of people working on skills demand uh, analysis. And it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, with you. Um, oh. I think someone can send on the slides for me, right? So if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, today in my presentation, I will provide you with a brief uh, overview of the rationale for skills anticipation uh, and matching. I will then uh, discuss a bit about definitions of the main concepts. Uh, um, and then I will talk about the tools that we use to analyze and anticipate skills needs. I will not enter into the detail of the single uh, different methods, uh, but uh, because we don't have that much of time, but of course I'm, ha I'm happy to discuss and to answer your questions uh, if you will have specific questions. And then I will provide some examples that can be of inspiration uh, for your institutions and for your countries. Next slide. Most countries, uh, ETF is working with 29 uh, countries around the European Union, uh, and also we look at the European Union uh, uh, member states. Please, next slide. Um, we see that most countries want and need to achieve a better understanding of the skills demand in order to develop uh, effective and well-functioning education, uh, training, and labor market, skills, uh, labor market systems, and to reduce the skills mismatch. So there are concerns about skills mismatch and anticipation, but the actual degree of the skills mismatch in the countries and what it means for people, for individuals, and for the economy is not fully known uh, yet. In the European Union, the discussion about skills anticipation and matching is, um, has started many years ago since 2004, so it's almost 20 years. And the main objective of this discussion is to understand what are the profession, what type of new qualification and skills are needed. So there are different questions uh, that skills anticipation need to respond. On the one side, uh, we ask ourselves, what are the skills that companies and the economic sectors need to maintain or to enhance their competitiveness? What are the skills that local, regional, or national economies need in order to grow and to develop? And of course, what are the in skills that individuals need to have to be success successful in the labor market? For young people, how can they enter the labor market? And for adults, how can they remain relevant in the, in the labor market? And in this discussion, the underlying uh, assumption is that education and training system know what the present and future demand for skill is so that they can adapt and they can prepare people accordingly. Next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, skills anticipation and anticipating skills needs, inevitably, we also talk about how the future will look like. Please, the next slide. Thank you. So uh, to do so, we as policymakers or researchers, we look into the different drivers of change that impact on skills demand in different uh, countries. And what we see is that the global challenges, the global trends affect all the countries in the world. In ETF, we started this reflection back in 2017, and we saw that the discussion about the future of work and the future of skills was very much debated in developed economies, in the US, in Europe, uh, in some Asian countries, but that much less evident information existed about developing countries or transition countries. So what we see, what we saw is that the single most important uh, uh, element of change or trend comes from the technology. But of course, you may say that from the printing press uh, to the steam engine, uh, the technology has always been um, a major force in overturning the status quo. 
But what is very different now is the exponential growth of this technology, the diffusion, and also the speed of the change, which as you very well know, happens much faster than in the past. Mobile internet, cloud computing, processing power are only part of the story because the impact of all of this technological revolution um, is, um, is also coupled with the data revolution, which creates an unprecedented amount of information together with the proliferation of technology-based business models, uh, which range from online retail platforms such as Amazon to care-hailing apps like Uber or to digital payments. But then we see that there are also many other uh, drivers of change which have a strong impact in the countries. And let me mention, for instance, uh, the whole greening uh, discussion. Global warming, hurricanes, flooding, extreme droughts, uh, the reduction of biodiversity are all elements that force policymakers to take action to pursue greening of economies. And they have a pressure because Consumers, citizens are also increasing their awareness. They want to go greener, and countries, policymakers have to respond to that trend. But we see also from our studies, the studies that we have conducted across our countries, that digitization, automation, greening are not the only factors impacting on the future of work. They are, of course, extremely important, but there are others that also have a very important role. And let me, for instance, mention trade, global value chains, uh, and digital tools. We also uh, learn, all of us globally, uh, that there are some shocks that can happen and that can completely change the situation in the country. Let me mention COVID-19. COVID-19 dramatically disrupted the, the trends and the projections everywhere in the world. And we saw that it amplified a number of processes that were already ongoing, for instance, digitalization, online learning, uh, remote working. These were elements that were already happening, but the COVID-19 was a huge shock that disrupted the situation everywhere in the world. Next slide. But what we see is that everything is connected. So some forces amplify one another, while others weaken the changes as they interact. But together, they are giving uh, rise to a monumental change that affects deeply the economic, social, and political landscape of all countries. And of course, they also pose a major risk, but also opportunities for inclusive, innovative, and greener societies. Please, next slide. So what we see is that all of these change shape the labor market in different countries. And we see that there are a number of changes that more or less uh, affect uh, countries across the borders. Please, next slide. The first uh, trend is the destruction of some jobs because of automation. The risk of automation has been studied very widely for a number of years by scholars around the globe. And what is quite interesting to see that there is a very, very wide variation in the results in some countries. So there are some studies that talk about massive destruction of jobs, while there are other studies that say, yes, some jobs will be destroyed, but new jobs will appear. Uh, what matters is whether uh, a task is a routine or not a routine. And there is a broad agreement overall in the literature that routine tasks, both cognitive and manual, are increasingly being automated, making some medium level uh, occupations redundant. So the, what we see is that the work is becoming uh, more intensive in non-routine tasks and routine ones are being automated. The second trend that we see relates to the changing task of, of the content of existing occupations, which leads to the revision or somehow to the redefinition of the task required to perform a given occupation, to, to do a job. 
the adoption of new technologies goes hand in hand with a new division of labor in which workers increasingly perform tasks that complement or oversee the machine. So we are not talking much about substitution of machine to humans, but more and more we talk about humans, human beings, people working with the machines. And some studies, of course, uh, point to the fact that upskilling and reskilling become key to allow workers uh, to adapt constantly, regularly in this changing uh, world of work. The third trend uh, refers to the polarization of the occupational structure, or job polarization, as we mentioned, as we call it. And job polarization refers to the declining share of medium skills jobs as opposed to an increasing share of high and lower skills jobs. This is due both to automation, affecting most routine jobs situated in the middle of the skills distribution, and also, of course, to the offshoring of the medium skills job in mostly in manufacturing because of the globalization in developing economies. And for instance, in Europe, just to give you uh, some examples, uh, our sister agencies, Telephone and Eurofund, have uh, uh, made some projection. And what they have found is that uh, uh, more or less four in five new jobs opening will relate to high skills occupation. So there is really like an increase of this higher end of occupations in the market. Then there is another trend which relates to the emergence of new jobs. So beyond the existing jobs, there are many new occupations, new jobs that are mostly linked to the new areas of activity created by the application of new technologies. For instance, we see everywhere new jobs such as blogger, bloggers, social media managers, podcast producer, influencer, search engine optimization, and so on but it's not only linked to, uh, to digitalization. For instance, uh, we have carried out a study in ETF about the automotive sector in Turkey, and we have found this new job, this new professional figure, uh, which in Turkish is called translator. But when they talk about translator, they don't refer to interpreters, but rather in the automotive sector, they talk about people who are able to translate the needs of some of the workers in the automotive company into digital language. So this is a translator in the automotive sector. And this is obviously a new, a new job, a new, a new position. Then there is another important uh, uh, trend, um, which lies in the changes occurring in the employment patterns. There are more and more non-standard forms of employment everywhere, atypical jobs that are expanding and increasing. Uh, there are many more uh, temporary jobs, fixed term jobs com compared to the past when there were more stable working relationship. There are many more freelancers, part-timers, independent contractor, and of course, also many more on-call or on-demand uh, workers. You may, for instance, think to the platform work, to the rising level of people working in the platform economy, and especially after the COVID-19. And what we saw is that platform work opens up many opportunities, but many opportunities for people with the right skills because you need to have some basic digital skills to enroll in the digital platform work and therefore to create value and to capture value. But of course, there are many opportunities because if you manage to enter into this platform where the barriers to entry are much lower than in the traditional labor market, you can find jobs that sometimes uh, have even uh, higher wages compared to your peers uh, in a given country. Of course, uh, these jobs uh, in the platform economy also come with many challenges. And the first challenge I want to refer to is the regulation. The fact that in, these, in, in most countries in the European Union as well, we are talking a lot about giving rights uh, to people working in the platform economy. And this links uh, to another rising element or trend, uh, which concerns the erosion of standard employment benefits. 
the changes in these employment uh, patterns, so these new forms of work, reduce dramatically the share of good jobs out of the total employment. So the full-time jobs, as we can think, based on the past, are uh, less and less existing. There are less benefits, there is more income insecurity, greater unpredictability. And usually, working hours tend to be excessively long or um, also too short, and with little or very limited social security. Next slide, please. So as jobs are changing and as there are all these impacts on the market, we see also that there is an increasing skills mismatch, which means that the education system is not able to follow the pace of change and prepare people with the right skills to enter and to remain in the labor market. So this is really a very common trend that uh, somehow put countries together because everywhere in the world we see on the one side many job seekers, especially among young people with rising level of youth unemployment. And on the other side, you see many companies that tell us that they cannot find people with the right skills. So there are many job vacancies that are and remain unfilled. And also we see that many people who work, so let's say that the lucky ones, those who have a job, often work in jobs which require a level of skills or qualification, which is below their level of skills or qualification. I will get back to that uh, in a moment. Next slide. I think I hand over to Anna for the Mentimeter. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, спасибо. Uh, сейчас uh, мы перейдем к интерактивной части. Uh, Thank you, Francesca. Now we will move to the interactive part. After we listened uh, to Francesca, we would like to find out and to ask you what are the tendencies and trends that you see in your labor market. In the chat, you will see the link and you can follow the link and answer this question. Uh, for the colleagues in Dushanbe, in, at your table, you are supposed to have some information about uh, how to use Mentimeter, or you can just use uh, this site, Mentimeter, and participate in this uh, um, survey. So what are the trends that you observe in the labor market in your you have two minutes. It would be interesting to listen uh, to uh, your opinion after we listen to Francesca's presentation on this. I can see that some answers, digitalization, the increase of the demand with the medium technical qualification specialist. Okay, you can write in English, if you are English speaking participants, it would be interesting to learn about this. And then we will continue the presentation. Um, are we supposed to express our opinion about this? Yes. Tell about your country. What kind of tendencies you observed in the labor market in your country? I'm sorry. I just uh, used the link. Where should I use the code? No, you do not need the code. It is just for those who do not have the direct access to the computer. Okay, thank you. Vulnerability. And the skills are quickly changing. Digitalization, yes. This is a global uh, trend, global tendency. We ask colleagues, well, the next one, uh, the increase of the dynamics of process and the information leads to the necessity to respond quickly 
distance work. Yes, we experience this. Uh, the flow of youth to the labor market, baby boom, interesting. This is one of the trends. Digitalization, new technologies. Uh, this requires new skills, expanding the skills and knowledge, quickly changing needs of the labor market. Business which turned to the education, which moves to the education, uh, digitalization. Well, Francesca, I think that we have the general view from our participants about the trends, um, the lack of the opportunities for everybody to study inclusiveness. I think we can stop and close this survey and we can move and continue the presentation. Uh, thank you, dear participants. We will come back to this. We will keep your answers, all those we are coming. Francesca, the floor is given to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And very interesting, um, many interesting inputs. And in fact, one uh, um, element that I didn't mention, but of course it's key, demography. The demographic changes in the different regions and countries is a key factor uh, for policies and a key factor driving uh, uh, the skills change. And so, I mean, uh, thank you. Those were very interesting contributions. So um, if you can put uh, up again uh, the, the presentation, uh, we can continue. And I think we need to um, discuss now about uh, some concepts, uh, some uh, definitions. I'm just waiting uh, so that uh, uh, the right slide can be displayed. It's up, I think. Yes, here, skills exactly. Thank you very much. So you can go to the next slide. I think it's important to clarify what we need by skills anticipation and by uh, skills matching. So when we talk about, next slide, when we talk about skills anticipation, we don't refer only to the future uh, trends, but we um, refer to all those attempts, all those studies, all that research that tries to capture and envisage possible aspects of future and present relationship between skills supply and demand. So when we look at the labor market, we look uh, first of all at the present, what is the current needs, what is the current situation, but also we try to anticipate what the situation will be in a given period of time, either in a short, medium or long, long term. Please go ahead with the next slide. Um, and when we refer to skills mismatch, we refer to um, a phenomenon which is very complex. First of all, um, skills mismatch is multidimensional because you can have either a surplus of skills, which means that there are too many skills for those jobs which are available in the labor market, or you can have a skills shortage which on the contrary means that you have not enough skills. So you have vacancies which are hard to fill. Or you can have both at the same time, which in fact is actually reflecting the reality in basically uh, all of the countries. And at the same time, you can have people that work in given jobs or profession that have a level of skills of qualification that is higher than the one required by the jobs. I referred to that before. And in this case, we talk about overqualification or overskilling. Or you can have people that uh, have the necessary qualification to fill a job, but they don't have the necessary skills. For instance, when their skills are obsolete, as in the case of digital skills. Uh, 
We also have cases of horizontal mismatch, meaning when a person who has studied in a given sector goes and work in another sector. Let's make the case of a doctor who decides to work as an artist, for instance. And let, let me just say that not all mismatch is bad. There may be a decision behind also by, by individuals. So when we talk about matching, we talk about an attempt to reduce these imbalances. And let me underline that the attempt is to reduce the imbalance, not to eliminate the imbalance, because that uh, is not realistic. That would not be possible. And in the ATF, we have been working a lot in the, in the past years to reach a better understanding and analysis of skills mismatch. We work on methodologies. We raise awareness in the countries about the usefulness and the complementarity of different methodological tools. And we also work to strengthen the institutional capacity of the partner countries' organization to analyze existing information and to generate new, new knowledge. Uh, and of course, matching is very much linked to the capacity of adapting education and training to the labor market needs, with the understanding that education and training is the key role to play in ensuring that the opportunities uh, are provided for all individuals and that individuals can enter uh, and remain in the labor market. Please, next slide. So clearly, the tools to be developed depend on a number of factors uh, or questions that the institution have to, to, to answer before they start or they embark in a skills anticipation exercise. So first of all, um, one has to ask uh, what is the uh, study or what is the research for? So what's the objective? What's the purpose? What do we want to know? And who are the users? Who are the target group of these uh, studies? And then of course, what are the resources available? You know, you know it very well, both human resources and financial resources. And last but not least, what data do we have in a country? Do we have enough data to embark in a specific exercise? Do we have uh, uh, historical trends? Uh, do we have data series? Uh, my colleague Mircea Badesco will talk more about data uh, later on. But let me just say that when we talk about data, um, we don't look at optimal data. We know that there are issues with data and sometimes uh, countries have to do with what they have. Uh, so they have to do what possible with the available information. Next slide. And of course, there are also different uh, uh, possibilities, different uh, time horizons for the investigation, short term, medium term, long term, and also different levels. Do you want to have information for the whole country or do you want to focus your research on the local level, at the regional level? All of that, of course, depends on the purpose of the research. So the key gold question is, what is your purpose? What do you want to um, explore? Next slide. So let me just uh, um, recap a bit what uh, we have said so far. So we said that there are many global trends that impact the world of work. And we say that these trends are all interconnected in a way they influence each other. We also say that the impact on the labor market is multiple with a transformative effect. So labor markets are changing in a number of ways that we have um, analyzed. And also we say that there are many levels of analysis depending on the purpose. So what we want to, to know. And please, next slide. And the bottom, the bottom line is that skills anticipation is complex, is a complex issue and a multiplicity of information sources are needed to provide qualitative or quantitative information in a short, medium, or long-term horizon at national, regional level, or also for economic sector, for some economic sectors. Please, next slide. So different tools exist to anticipate skills needs that combine quantitative and qualitative types of information. And of course, one of the major limitations is that reliable skills anticipation systems are relatively complex and also expensive because data collection is expensive. 
but it should be stressed that a comprehensive labor market information system analysis of these needs is really the backbone of any education and training strategy. So in the slide here, you see a number of different uh, uh, tools uh, that are developed internationally and used internationally. We have used them also uh, with many of our countries. And uh, you can see that there are um, studies that are, you know, like uh, uh, forecasting, for instance, which is more based on, on the past, on quantitative type of information. So forecasting is... Uh, um, a projection of what will happen in the future, mostly based on the information we have from the past. We have uh, uh, worked a lot with foresight studies, and we are still working a lot with foresight studies, which are different because they are um, mixed methods. They are more qualitative type of approach looking at the future, also based on uh, facts, on hardcore data of the past. But it's more qualitative. It's more a process of talking in a participatory and organized manner with groups of stakeholders to envision the future. So it's a more iterative process and uh, leaves more space for institution to discuss where a given country wants to go in a given period of time, maybe in a specific uh, uh, policy. We work a lot also with uh, uh, employer surveys, for instance, which is uh, quite, uh, I mean, immediate. Ask employers if you want to know what companies need, talk to employers, talk to sectorial associations, ask them what, what are their um, skills needs right now and what will be uh, in the future. And we have also worked a lot with tracer studies, which are um, called in different countries in different ways, but tracer studies or graduate tracking is uh, mostly the work done to understand the outcome of students in the labor market. So how they are doing after a given period of time. And all of these tools, of course, have uh, um, like uh, potential um, offer potential opportunities, but they also have limitations. So they have challenges. Uh, when I was talking about the forecast, for instance, I refer to the time series in the past. So the conviction in a way that the past can be projected on the future. We discuss about COVID. Nobody could envision COVID. So COVID was not part of the models. It was very difficult to factor that in. So it was, I mean, obviously that was a disruption. That was a shock that uh, proved many exercises wrong. Nobody could really factor that in in advance. Um, so all of these studies are pros and cons, and the selection of which type of methodology one has to apply in a country, as I mentioned before, really depends on what you want to um, achieve. Please, next slide. Okay, I hand over to Anna for the Mentimeter. Thanks a lot, Francesca. Now, the next question, you have the link in the chat and for colleagues in Dushanbe, there is a QR code to the site. And here is the next question, which is quite simple. What monitoring tools and forecasting skills you believe are the most useful and you can choose among different options? And you've got just a minute. Uh, to answer and what are the uh, options so this could be the survey of the employers the sectoral uh, research also this could be survey among the graduates and also tracking of the graduates and uh, quantitative forecasting and the qualitative studies so far, we see that the main choice, this is a survey among the employers, and also we can see that the quality interviews focus groups. Yes, uh, the employers surveys, it looks like a very dominant choice, and also 
also survey of the graduates and uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, tools are also being selected, but we can see that the surveys among the employers are the most popular, is the most popular choice. We also have tracking of the graduates. So the trend is quite straightforward here. Thank you. And uh, based uh, on the all the collected results there will be more reports issued but now we'll be, the floor is back to you francesca thank you anna thanks a lot so we can go on with uh, with the presentation i will try to um, go a bit faster because i think the time is running um but and also you will speak more about data and data sources with my colleague uh, uh, Mircea. Um, what I want to say is that we spoke about the different tools uh, and what we see is also that different tools have different timelines and levels and the purpose of the analysis determines what instruments you need to use. For instance, if you use employer surveys, most likely you will receive information about the short term. Employers are very good in telling you what they need today or in a rather short period of time, but the capacity of employer to project in a longer term perspective, it's much uh, uh, more limited. Apart of course from bigger companies, well-structured uh, companies. Please next slide. Um, I will go fast here. Of course, data sources are uh, very different. Uh, there are traditional data sources that fill uh, skills uh, anticipation uh, uh, tools, uh, but also uh, innovative tools uh, such as, for instance, big data. Big data is now a huge area of investigation in ETF. We are, we are working a lot on big data, not only to track, uh, for instance, online job vacancies, but also to analyze uh, the markets uh, for instance, through the use of text mining techniques. Next slide. And there are different data providers, statistical offices. Some of you come from statistical offices, but also ministries, public employment service, researchers, web providers, and so on. Next slide, please. So what to do once uh, the information is gathered? Um, we speak about knowledge creation, the process of generating and using the tools that I've just described. Uh, but then of course, the creation of the knowledge is not enough per se. You need to like to share the knowledge with the uh, target groups, and you also have to apply the knowledge. And I would say that the knowledge application is the most important step for, for knowledge. You need to use the knowledge, you need to make sure that knowledge generated fits the policy uh, making, is used to generate new policies or to improve existing uh, policies. And the problem is, of course, that countries um, often embark in uh, tools in exercises to generate information, but uh, in many cases, this information then is not used by, by the policy makers. Next slide. So we ask ourselves if there is a right uh, methodology and the answer, the straightforward answer is no, that there is no right, single right methodology. But what you need is rather a combination of the different tools according to the needs and the resources. Knowing that, of course, the information generated can be used for different purposes. And I mentioned, for instance, career guidance, provision, qualification, upskilling and reskilling, you name it. It really depends. It really depends on what you need in the country. Please, next slide. There are a number of success factors that we see um, need to be there in order to ensure that good quality information is generated and then used. And I would say that ownership scores very high in the list of success factors. The process needs to be owned by a national institution. There should be a leading institution that coordinates the process. And of course, that goes hand in hand with the analytical capacity and the resources available in the country. And another element of success is the regularity of the exercise. What we see is often that countries implement one tool, 
one study, ad hoc. But if you don't have the regularity of the exercise, or, so if these exercises are not embedded in the system of a country, then you risk of having you know, a point in the space, but you need really to see the trend and the continuation of these exercises uh, over time. Please, next slide. I hand over to Anna to the, for the Mentimeter. Пожалуйста, коллеги, ссылка в чате. И мы переходим к следующему вопросу. Dear colleagues, the link is in the chat. Now you can move to the next. Итак, по вашему мнению, основные проблемы? What are the main gaps in the development or in the introduction of such tools which have been uh, right now presented by Francesca? Your quick replies, your quick uh, reflection and uh, reflection of your ideas and opinions. Достоверность данных, в первую очередь. Пер, so пер... the data validity, first yeah. of all, that was the very first reply received. The quality and the coverage of the baseline data, the volume of the funding, the data validity, purity. Всего несколько минут, чтобы закрыть первую. We've got only a few minutes left in order to close the first session. And then we have time to start and to introduce openness, the quality and the coverage of data, the problem of funding, the data validity, stable funding, the relevance of the tools, research tools, how relevant it is to the uh, data accessibility level and the lack of understanding among the stakeholders, lack, a lack of the... Uh, so we have an, an interruption. We are asking our participants to mute themselves. So lack of the connection between the institutions, economy and policies, and the human capacities. Thank you. I believe that we've generated a sufficient number of the replies. Now the floor is back to you, Francesca. Thank you. Uh, yes, that was very complete. In fact, you mentioned all of the aspects that I wanted to, uh, to, to, to mention myself, talking about the limitations, uh, data quality, reliability, regularity of exercises, international comparability, but then, of course, also the capacity to generate and use the data to give continuity and to follow these rapid uh, changes that happen in the market. Um, so we can go on, and I want to just use the few minutes uh, that, uh, that remain to um, briefly uh, present you a couple of examples uh, that could be inspirational. Um, as I said before, there is no right or wrong methodology. There are rather different approaches that fit for a purpose, uh, so that uh, are uh, selected according to the specific needs uh, of the country. So for instance, in the European Union, next slide, one very interesting example is uh, the EU skills uh, panorama uh, that was uh, developed uh, quite some time ago. It started in 2012, um, and it was an initiative of the European Commission then managed by our sister agency, Serifop. Now in 2021, uh, it became a, a new platform called Skills Intelligence. It's on the um, set of uh, web, website. What is interesting uh, is that the Skills Panorama is a unique online platform that offers a single entry point to information on skills needs and labor market in the EU. 
So in a single portal, you can find all information about the different countries, the labor market, sectors, occupation, um, and you don't only have data, um, which are generated in the in the website, but you also find a repository of all analytical knowledge, uh, uh, articles, reports that are written about a, like a specific uh, sector or occupation. It's a platform which is open to the public, so it's free access. Um, and policymakers and, uh, and experts are, of course, the primary target group, but it also attracts a huge number of researchers and also employment and guidance uh, uh, counselors, for instance. It's structured around a series of dashboards. There are like more than 2,000 dashboards, which, as I said before, are um, organized by occupation, sector, countries, uh, uh, indicators, and so on. So this is one example of a single um, repository, if you want, a single portal where information are really gathered in a, a very well uh, structured way. Uh, please, next. Uh, there are other countries which uh, instead uh, work more based on observatories, um, and France is one of these cases. In France, if you um, uh, analyze the way in which labor market information system is structured, uh, you will see that it is structured around a number of observatories, which are uh, um, called Observatoire de Branche, for instance, like observatory in the different economic sectors, uh, a very like well-known one used also as an example, worldwide as Green Skills Observatory, for instance, that was uh, set up uh, a few years for which looks particularly at the new skills emerging linked to the green uh, occupations, uh, so the green, the green skills. But you also have this national observatory and the regional observatory. So you have a bit of this matrix of different entities that each has a specific um, point of observation. Next slide. And then you have also specific uh, um, tools, specific methodologies, and I brought here the example that ETF has developed, looking at uh, the future skills needs in specific economic sectors using mixed methodology. You see here, I don't have the time to go into detail, but you will see here that the methodology that we have developed um, to understand new skills needs in economic sectors is based on uh, the use of traditional empirical methods of research together with the use of big data. And big data in this sense is text mining techniques applied to patents and scientific uh, literature. I can tell you more if you are interested, but I don't want to take too much time here. Next slide. So, um, just to really wrap up, um, uh, because I, I really want to conclude. Next slide. Um, I think that it's important to, um, to, to understand and to leave you with few key concepts. The first one is that mixed approaches are the one which are winning in a way. Uh, you need to use different approach to mix them in a way that serve the purpose of your country. The participation of different uh, actors and stakeholders is fundamental. It's a complex exercise, as I said in the beginning, and you need different actors, stakeholders, uh, companies on board for the exercise. And also the approach needs to be holistic in line with the development goals of, of countries. And of course, the last very important point is about the use of the finance. You cannot have research tools that generate very good findings, but then are left on the shelf. And these um, uptake of knowledge really requires a, a lot of uh, time and a lot of investment. Next slide. Um, I will go next, next. <laughs> Sorry, so just to conclude with some um, um, word, next one again, some word on the actors. As I say, then here you really represent a different uh, uh, institution. I think that uh, uh, anticipation and matching really requires uh, the presence of several different actors. There are different interests around the table. But uh, matching skills, supply and demand involves necessarily the cooperation, 
the mediation and the negotiation between education and employment system and the business uh, sector. All actors have a role to play and the interaction, the interplay between these actors really generates uh, good, good results. So what we see is that in countries where this anticipation system works well, there is a virtuous cycle of dialogue between the different parts uh, of the society. I will close here and sorry if I went a little bit uh, over time. Thank you.